the stress level has to be continually increasing. That's an easy thing to do. Uh, it happens automatically in the novice program, right? Because you're just adding five pounds every time. It's easy to screw things up really bad on the uh, once you've gone to weekly increases and then biweekly increases and so on, uh, <clears throat> because people tend to dump stress. So things things cannot get easier. If they get easier, if you're excited about the programming change that you just made, it's uh, it's it wasn't a good programming change. Like you're about to run into some problems. Everyone's favorite guest is back. Nick is here. We're going to talk about intermediate programming. If you haven't seen the episode entitled How to Do the Starting Strength Novice Linear Progression, you should listen to that one first, unless you're getting towards the end of your LP and you're pretty sure you've done most of it right, in which case you can jump straight to this episode because we will start by reviewing the steps it takes to get through your novice stage per lift, just a quick summary. And then we'll talk about what it means to be an intermediate, what the definition is. And then we'll give you some suggestions. And it's not, it's not quite as templatized as you'll discover. It's more about understanding how to apply stress and, and what's necessary to recover from based on your current stage of training advancement. So with that in mind, Nick, uh, why, don't, why don't we start there? So could you, let's start with the squat. Can you just give us a very quick summary of how you would progress the average trainee through squat from day one through the end of the novice program? So let's say 40 year old male jumps into a gym training three days a week. What does his squat programming look like from day one through finish the novice phase? Uh, yeah. So the, the video that we did, and this was, I think that this may have been episode one of the gym's podcast, right? Uh, I think so. Probably it's probably one of the most uh, valuable videos for programming um, that that I've ever done. So I, I pass that around to coaches, especially a lot. Uh, so everybody, if you haven't watched that, you should go back and, and watch it for sure. <clears throat> and um, we'll link to it. Yeah, yeah, because there's a lot of a lot of uh, as simple as the novice program is. There's a ton of misunderstanding about how to actually apply it for some reason, because everybody wants to make things more complicated than they need to be. Yep. Uh, but, but the main idea is you are going to start with the simplest and most effective version of things that will get you the most progress and uh, most out, uh, most benefit in terms of total output, uh, that you can get right, and this is this is the same for any process, any complicated process that you could embark upon, whether it's physical or anything else. So, uh, the the starting strike novice linear progression gives us that. It gives us a, a nice prepackaged uh, template. Really, is what it is. It's a it's a, a, a package template that you can apply based on the situation that will get you a lot of strength very very quickly. It'll progress your variables in a way that makes sense because what we're looking for is a strength adaptation. Therefore, you need to apply a force production stress. And the novice linear progression uses the, the the five lifts that give you the biggest force production stress throughout your body in order to make you strong quickly, right? So, um, so the way we're going to approach this is is systematically starting with the novice linear progression uh, and running a process and making changes as they become necessary. All right. So one of the one of the most important principles now that we're going to start talking about programming beyond the novice linear progression or beyond the novice phase. Um, and I don't know if we need to cover this again, but a novice is just anybody who's never done it. Right. And and the, the term novice is is helpful, but it, it can be it can be uh, misleading depending on who you're talking to and how you're using the term. So I like to think about it. And for the purposes of this discussion, it may be helpful to just think about it as your starting point. It's your entry point into a process of, of performance improvement. So you're going to start with the most basic program that you can, and then you're going to change things as they become, as changes become necessary. Um, so getting back to my point, 
anytime we talk about programming changes, if you are doing things correctly and we're making the assumption that you want to continue getting stronger and that uh, efficient use of your time in the gym is important and that efficient movement is important. So if those three things are important to you um, and they and they take priority because um, because you want to run an efficient process, then you need to consider things on a on a uh, on a deeper level than most people do. Because what most people do is they run a program uh, for a given period of time. Usually the program is is templated out for eight to twelve to sixteen weeks or whatever it is, and then after that program's over, they switch programs. Or more commonly for our friends and fans, uh, you'll start with a program that makes sense and you make a whole bunch of progress very quickly. And then when things get hard is when you make a programming change. So um, all of those things may be true, but the proper approach is to, uh, and this is the, the, the very important point here, is that programming changes are made reluctantly. Programming changes are made because you have to make a programming change, not because you want to make a programming change. All of my assumptions right now are that, are that we're running this this process optimally. Mm -hmm. So um, so reluctant programming changes, um, and I don't remember if we mentioned this uh, the last time we talked programming, but first thing you have to look at is, is your technique efficient, mostly efficient, right? Are you doing things that are affecting the weight on the bar significantly? If that's the case, get it get it tuned up. Fix, get a, get a form check, go see a coach, do it online, whatever, but get your form tuned up. Second thing, are you training consistently? So I'm making the assumption that you are actually training and not missing three or four workouts a month. If that's the case, uh, don't make a programming change. Get your consistency in order or your consistency, your compliance in order, and then um, and then see what happens, right? Uh, and then the third thing is recovery. Are your recovery, all of the things that go into recovery, are those in order? Uh, if they're not in order, then either get them fixed or you may need to make a programming change that's not the optimal deal in terms of continuing to get stronger. All right. So with that kind of groundwork laid, I'm I'm making the assumption that we are proceeding optimally, that you're recovering, meaning that you're steadily, gradually gaining weight and getting bigger and stronger. Um, if you're if you're overweight, you're either holding your weight or you're very gradually losing weight, um, depending on what your what your goals are. But most people, most of the time, are going to be gaining a little bit of weight on the novice program. Um, that you are making appropriate jumps, all the recovery stuff, um, and that you are not missing workouts, and that your form is pretty good. All right. So with all those things said, for a squat, uh, it's the basic program, squatting every workout, three days a week, one rest day in between, uh, adding five pounds to the bar uh, every single workout. Right. So um, three sets of five. Three, yeah, three sets of five. Now, that that's the novice linear progression, all right? So as soon as we start messing with that program, you're no longer doing the novice linear progression. Now, that's not a bad thing, all right? But just understand that the trade-offs at this point are that you are slowing down your progress in order to uh, continue making progress longer term. All right. So that's, that's the way I'm thinking about it. So we're adding three sets of five, or I'm sorry, we're adding five pounds to the bar, the three sets of five for four months, five months, six months, depending on where you started and your age and all these different things. Um, so let's say your average 40 year old guy comes into the gym and he squats 85 pounds, 90 pounds the first day. Um, I expect this first programming change to happen maybe when he's up, up around the mid two hundreds with for a squat mid 200s it's usually about where it starts happening uh, and all i'm looking at as a coach is, is is bar speed and then also you know just just generally how the how the the, the client or the uh the lifter is looking and feeling workout to workout right so as i'm seeing over time that the bar speed is uh that things are happening to the bar speed within within a set right because the load is always going to make the bar speed slower but i'm noticing that things are starting to get much much harder um or I'm noticing that the next workout is is it may result in a failed uh, rep. Uh, I'll make I'll make a programming change. <clears throat> Again, provided that all of the other parameters are in order, and that first programming change is do a light day in the middle of the week. So you don't know, take 80% off the bar, and then proceed as usual on Monday and Wednesday. So let's. It's important to talk about like what are the trade-offs there. The trade-off is that I've slowed my progress by five pounds a week. 
but consider where you are three, four months, you know, 12 to 16 weeks into this program, you're adding weight every single time. And um, the moment comes where you uh, are faced with potentially bailing on a rep or giving yourself a light day in the middle of the week and then hitting the workout on Friday fresh uh, and excited about that PR rather than just continuing to, to grind through and potentially failing, failing a rep. Um, and I, and I keep saying, saying failing a rep because for the people in the demographic that I'm typically dealing with, um, they're risk averse, you know, they, are, they're something on their body probably hurts and I don't want to give a, a new lifter. These are new lifters, right? Three to four months in, I don't want to give a new lifter the idea that it's okay to fail and set the bar down on the pins. So we're not going to do that. We're going to keep making progress. So if that means slowing down five pounds a week, I'm cool with that. Cause it, it'll give me another another month, another six weeks, sometimes even another eight, eight weeks of progress where, where alternatively we could have just beat the shit out of ourselves for the next five workouts and hit a wall a week and a half from now. Right. So that's, that's the way I'm looking at it. So mm -hmm. relatively minor change, not a big deal in the grand scheme of things, but it, I just gave myself another month of runway with this, with this individual. <clears throat> By adding Continuing a light day. Progress. By adding a light day. Yeah. yeah. So in other words, my, my next big programming change happens at the 300 pound mark rather than at the 265 pound mark. Yep. Does yep. that make sense? How I, how I said that? So absolutely. I, I, yeah. So I could, I could keep, I could keep pushing on this guy and have him start questioning everything at 265, or we could slow down just a little bit, right? Just back off this throttle back a little bit. Um, keep making progress. And then now but when we need to make the next programming change, he's at 300 pounds yep. for a dude who started at 90 pounds with his squat. This is a significant difference. This, these 30 pounds matter a lot. Sure. Right. And, and just to so, reiterate your point, Nick, keep in mind, these are illustrative numbers. A lot of people get fixated on numbers and think when yeah. I hit number X, I need to make a change. That's not what we're saying here. We're saying it's, it's individual dependent and it's dependent on your, your bar speed. And the worst thing you can do for your training is get some number in your mind and you have to make some change when you hit some certain number. That is not how this works. Yeah. Well, and here's, here's another good point. Um, because it's such a small change, what if you made the change too early? Doesn't matter. Not a big deal, right? Because it, uh, it'll get hard soon. It'll get harder soon enough. So, um, you know, you can assign whatever values you want to continuing to 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 grind yourself into the uh, into the into the pavement workout after workout. I, I'd much rather see you continuing to lift and progress for the next two years than uh, than than uh, you know start drinking a gallon of milk and gain thirty pounds to put fifteen pounds on the bar. Uh, it's not that's not a good idea. So. Yep. Um, so yeah, so again, using using just the, the general example here, the guy's now up around 300 pounds for his squat, um, and he uh, is on a on a progression where every Wednesday is a light day. So we got a we got we got some some runway out of that small change. So you know, let's say high 200s, low 300s. I, I'm going to make the next programming change again based on on how the lifter is responding to to things in general. Um, you know, you have to remember that like you've got recovery and you've got strength and you've got, you've got stress and you've got recovery just kind of moving up at the same time. And there's just these, these points where, where they meet and, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta just kind of back off a little bit to keep things moving in the, in the proper direction. So um, the next change that I'll make is that I will only go up on the first set of five for the squat, because that's usually, even though it usually doesn't feel the greatest that first set, but you're fresh, you know, it, um, first set of five, uh, maybe feels the hardest. And then after that, the rest of the workout almost feels like, like cake after you uh, take a little bit of weight off. So, um, we'll still, we're keeping all of the, all of the volume and everything pretty much the same. The only thing we're, we're messing with is, is intensity. So let's say the first set of five on that Monday is 300 pounds. Then we'll do two sets of five at 90% of that. So, uh, 270, right. So, uh, and then the middle, middle day of the week, Wednesday is still 80%. So that's going to be at 240 or so, right? 240 for the three sets of five. And then on Friday, we go up to 305 for the first set and 275 for the two back off sets. And again, that's another change that gives me another another six to eight weeks of, of runway. So now, you know, we're not making the next programming change 
until um and i know i know like some people are like doing the math and and checking my numbers it, it doesn't fucking matter right but the next programming change is not going to happen until we're at like 340 you know 330 340 so we start getting into weekly increases um at three at, at the mid 300 pound mark rather than at the at the high 200s or, or mid 200s which uh you know a lot of guys doing this on their own are looking to make programming changes into weekly increases um in the in the high 200s and low 200s it's not it's not uh that's you as rip would say you're not doing the program right um so yeah and just to back up a little bit anything that is not three sets of five squatting three days a week adding five adding more weight to the bar every single time is no longer the novice linear progression right and that's okay so we're, we're moving beyond it and we're uh, advancing our programming variables, progressing our programming variables into a little bit more complexity in order to account for uh, for the increased weight and recovery and to be able to continue driving progress without tapping yourself out in terms of recovery, right? <clears throat> Got it. All right, so the squat summary, as Nick just outlined and, and is in more detail in the podcast episode we referenced is three sets of five, go up five pounds of workout, do that three days a week. And then... Um, when the bar speed starts to slow down and, you, and you're concerned that you might miss a rep, add a light day, three sets of five at 85, at 80%, uh, and that's on Wednesday. And then when, when you have the same thing happen and it's time for another change, then you do drop sets. So you go, you go up on the first set and then you do 90% for the last two sets and you do that twice a week. So now, so, you, so at that point, you're still going up twice a week. So you're technically still a novice. And when you move to, to weekly jumps, you're then an intermediate on that particular lift. So Nick, if you're thinking about a standard member at a starting strength gym who's training three days a week, a uh, 40-year-old guy in this scenario, how would you then transition him from that last stage, so you know, drop sets in a light day, to a more uh, intermediate program with, with weekly progression? Uh, I'm just going to decide which day is going to be the heavy day. So it's either going to be Monday or Friday. And uh, usually it's, usually it's, uh, it's Monday because, you know, you've got the weekend and stuff, but that that's personal preference. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. You, you pick one day of the week to be the heavy day. Um, and then you only go up on that first set for that one day. So let's, let's just say we're at 340 uh, for the squat. Now 340 for a set of five is the guy's PR. So next Monday, he goes to 345 and then 90% for the other two sets, 80% on Wednesday. And then on Friday, it's three sets of five at 90% of 345. So that's, that's a, you know, a, a weekly increase on the squat. So that's what you would con consider intermediate uh, programming for, for the, the squat at that point. Now, uh, remember what I said about the stress and recovery parameters kind of uh meeting and having this inflection point uh when you get to that point you know honestly that that single set of five uh isn't gonna isn't going to give you much progress uh we're talking about a month tops maybe maybe less um so that's that's how i initially set it up and i try to try to squeeze as much out of that just one one time a week heavy set of five as much as i can Usually other things in the program are going to help that. Like how, how hard are they, are they working on their, like how high is their deadlift? If the deadlift's real high, they can, they'll probably keep making progress on that squat for a while. If their deadlift and their squat are real close, that, that their, their overall stress is going down. So, um, or, or staying about the same. So you, you kind of are going to get stuck. Um, so this is where, this is what, where kind of the, the, the whole program needs to be taken into account. But, um, my point is that that's not going to last long. So you have to be thinking ahead to what the next change is going to be that I'm going to make. So, but, but I, but you've got the template now, right? You've got heavy, light, medium. You've got a heavy, light, medium setup. What well, doesn't matter if heavy is on Monday or Friday. Now you just decide, okay, so my heavy day is going to be heavy. Now, what do I do next? And probably the simplest thing to do is, well, let's go to triples and we'll do some triples. We'll do three sets of three and start driving PRs on three sets of three um, for that Monday and then leave everything else the same. Right. And then eventually it's going to be like, okay, threes are, are not working. And then you just run it out. Like it's typically what people say when they run it out. So I'm going to do singles now. Now, when you get to singles, you got to be careful because you're, you're potentially dropping a whole bunch of stress 
uh, by doing that. So, you know, cause you went from, f- from five reps to 10 reps with your triples to now, you know, maybe five singles. Um, it's usually not enough. So usually if I'm having someone do singles, I'm having them do, uh, some, some back off work, uh, on that same day, or again, depending on the rest of the, 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 the program, something else may be going on the, the, with a deadlift or something to keep, keep the stress fairly high. And so just, just uh, to clarify, Nick, you were talking about having the deadlift pretty far ahead of the squat. And uh, based on our previous conversations, in my experience, I think what you're talking about is is roughly 50 pounds plus ahead of the squat for your deadlift number. Is that about right? At least. Yeah, at least that's where it should be. And it might not be at, the, at this point in the in your program, but this is the opportunity now to run your deadlift up. Right. Because you're only squatting one heavy set of five. So whatever. And and at this point, you, you know, I guess if you want to go through each lift, we will. But the but at this point, you're probably only deadlifting once a week. So that deadlift has to be a set of five and it has to be super heavy and it has to be going up. So, you know, if if um, if I've got a, 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 a lifter who's, let's say, squatting 345 for one set of five on Monday and deadlifting 340 or 350, we're going to start making 10 pound jumps on the, on the deadlift uh, just to, just to bring it up because they can, right. As long as all the, the positioning and mechanics and everything's right, we're going to start running up the deadlift um, as quick as we can. Got it. I do want to do this for each lift, Nick, but before we get into the other three lifts, um, I want to, want to ask you to shed some light on the principles that are at play here. So we've, we've, uh, we're moving away from a very templatized approach in the novice phase where you just do this, then do that, then do that. Absolutely. And then we're moving into intermediate and then things become a little bit more murky. And this is where people get tripped up. So can you talk to us about what, what the considerations are in your mind when you're making programming changes at this level? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And uh, this is why I keep saying like, anytime you deviate from the basic novice linear progression, um, you are no longer doing the novice linear progression. And that's okay because we're, you know, we're, we have other considerations. Now we're still really close, right? So you can call it whatever you want. We're still really close because we're still going up twice a week. We only have one light day in the middle, but, but we're modifying the program. Um, and, and, but it's necessary to modify the program. So with that said, you can approach this however you want the way I approach it is going to be different from maybe the way you approach it or the way, uh, you know, another more experienced coach, like some guys like to use triples at the end of the novice, uh, you know, call it advanced novice or whatever, um, like to use triples. It doesn't matter. Like the point is that the weight on the bar needs to keep going. I prefer this approach because it keeps me on, keeps, keeps us on sets of five. Um, It's simpler, right? It's simple, simpler to deal with because all we're messing with is just intensity and and, uh, um, that's it, just intensity over the the course of the week. Um, So it's easier for me to to explain and it's easier for me to to program for people. So it doesn't matter how you do it. Just make sure that the weight on the bar is going up. And the further you deviate from fives at this stage in someone's training, um, the more likely you are to fuck things up, right? So threes are still okay ones a single start to become a problem and then the other direction going into sevens seven eights tens that just it just doesn't work at all so you're not you're no longer strength training at this point so um so so i always try to keep fives as the as the main thing and this is like this isn't anything i i this is all just the way it is and the way we've always talked about this you want to keep fives in the in the program as long as possible so this is the way i do it um let me just and, pause you there uh, real quick, Nick, because because yeah. isn't there a, isn't there a caveat that fives applies to uh, slightly below average males and above? In other words, you you probably want to end this process doing threes for your typical female client or for your your significantly below average male client. Is that right? For sure, women women are going to be doing threes fairly early. So, uh, and that's that's a pretty. Uh, that's a that's a pretty universal change um, that w- when th- women women need to train heavier, uh, they, they, the bar needs to get heavier because of the neuromuscular efficiency situation being different from from males, right? So they recruit muscle mass at a at a slower rate is probably the way to think about it than males. So the way you the way you get more muscle mass recruited is by increasing load, right? And more time, more time and more load. So what you'll see with women is that they can grind through reps heavier at sets of three and they need to in order to continue driving a strength adaptation so um yeah everything i just said in terms of fives 
make that threes for women. That's yep. typically that's typically what you see. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So when we're yeah, since we're super sexist, when I talk about this stuff, it's generally with like a, a, a typical male, um, a, a typical male trainee. Uh, but it, it's not that complicated for women. It's just three sets of five becomes five sets of three. Right. And by the time this episode goes live, I will have a video up uh, going through the novice linear progression specific to uh, um, to the female population. So Bree, please link to that as well. Um, and Nick, before we move into the other lifts, I wanted to clarify one more big picture concept with you. When, when a trainee has a problem with intermediate programming, so they start missing reps or whatever other problem might occur, how do they, how do they understand what's causing that problem? How do they think about that problem so they can figure out how to solve it? Does that question make sense? I think so. So when, when somebody starts failing reps, so the program's how, not working. Why? How do I figure okay. out what? How do I figure out what I did wrong here? Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so provided that it's not a technique error, all right. So we always have to consider the efficiency of the technique. Provided that it's not a technique error and it's a programming issue, then there are two ways that you should look at. Uh, you should look at um, overall progress, and uh, so this kind of goes into a larger point here. So. Um, how, how, how you determine what kind of programming change you need to make. So when we're talking about the squat, um, you can think about it in terms of, of, uh, stress and recovery, um, not aligning in terms of recovery, not being able to keep up with the amount of stress that you're applying. Right. So in other words, um, I hate to say like under, under recovered, um, it, it's just too much too much stress or not enough stress is probably the way to think about it, right? Because mm -hmm. again, we're assuming that you're that you're doing things properly and you're recovering properly. Uh, if you're not, then it's it's kind of a separate conversation about what what what, what we need to do because now you're considering trade offs. You're considering like, all right, well, I'm I'm I know that I can only sleep four hours continuously a night because I have an infant at home, so I'm making this programming change, knowing that it's not the best thing to do, and I'm just kind of holding on. Uh, but assuming that everything is is in line it's you you can simplify it in terms of too much stress not or not enough stress so when you have too much stress which is typically what occurs when you get to the end of your novice linear progression with the squat and the deadlift what you'll see is a is a is a is a decline in performance that's gradual right so if you kind of imagine your your performance curve on the squat. Let's just look at the squat. It's going up like this, right? As when you first start the program, it goes like this and it shoots straight up and then it starts to flatten out a little bit, right? And then um, let's say that you're starting to have, uh, that your recovery capacity is not keeping up with the inc with the regular increases on the weight of the bar. What you'll see is a, is a slight, you know, a, a steady decline in performance, meaning, meaning that the, like, let's just look at the bar speed. You'll see the bar speed just getting slower and slower and slower every rep, every workout, the bar speed gets slower and slower and slower, right? So that's an indicator to me that you're not adapting, um, that you're not adapting for whatever reason. So um, the bar speed will always be slow on rep four and definitely rep five if you're doing things correctly, but it shouldn't be the same speed on rep it shouldn't, it shouldn't like rep one of the next workout first set rep one of the first, first rep of the first set of the next workout shouldn't look like the fourth rep of the third set of the last workout. So I hope I'm being clear there. Right. Yeah, yeah, so that's that what I'm, mean that's what I mean by reduction because it's only five pounds more. So I shouldn't see like, I shouldn't see a bar speed that looks like it's 30 pounds heavier. Yep. So that's, that's what I'm looking at. And if, and if that's what I'm starting to see, then I'm making a programming change because I'm starting to see a decline in performance, um, <clears throat> uh, or aches and pains, right? Like this hurts, this other thing hurts. I'm having trouble sleeping. Um, I, uh, I have trouble getting, getting to sleep. Um, I feel like I can't eat after, you know, all these different things that weren't a problem three weeks ago, like all of a sudden are a problem. Um, and it may not actually be like a, a, a physical recovery issue. It may be all up here, but either way, the solution is the same for me, right? If I add a light day, I might solve all those problems right now. Um, so all, I'm looking at all those things, bar speed primarily, because that's my mostly objective based on my experience, um, indicator of what's going on. Could I tell the lifter move the bar faster? Maybe, right? But 
Um, I could do that and see what happens. And uh, it, it's going to depend on on the lifter, uh, how much, how, how hard they want to push against the bar. But, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not looking at this guy for the first time today. I've been watching him lift for the next, for the last four to six months. So I know what things look like. I know what, uh, I know what to expect. Um, and then I'm, I'm hearing things from the lifter about, uh, about, you know, aches and pains, things, things that are, that are starting to happen that are weird. Uh, so that's what I mean by that. If that's what I mean by too much stress okay. under stressed, so not enough stress looks like this. Here's your performance curve. And this is what you see on the press or what you see if you try to keep women on sets of five for too long, right? So in other words, you detrain, it's not enough stress. So you see your performance curve go like this, it moves up quickly. And then you have a sharp drop. Like you just have a sharp drop in performance. Nothing hurts. Um, everything looks good. Bar speed on rep one of set one of the of today's workout looks the the same as rep one of set one of the last workout, like you, the same bar speed, like bar speeds going great. You're thinking you're about to have a fantastic workout and all of a sudden, bam, you start failing. And this is what everybody on the, on the, on the face of the earth has experienced with their press. Um, and this is what uh, women have experienced when they try to do sets of five for too long. Um, and that's what that looks like. Right. So those are the, those are the kind of the cleanest ways to look at these two things. Very so, helpful. Yeah. So, so people will say something like, uh, and I still see this on, on like the, on, on the internet, people responding in the Facebook group and stuff. Uh, a guy starts failing his press uh, for the first time and people will say, well, you, you're not recovered. You need to, uh, you need to uh, go to threes or you need to um, eat more and then try it again. You know, um, you know, you're pressing 145 pounds. Eating more is not your problem you know, you're just not getting enough stress. One caveat I think that needs to be added to this is if you uh, are an intermediate trainee and you're doing your own programming and you're trying to make sense of, of how to adjust variables and you just understood the concepts that Nick has shared with you in terms of whether your problem is too much stress or not enough stress. If you make a change, make a small change. Nick, can right. you expand on that concept? Yeah, your your original question was an intermediate trainee who starts failing reps. How do they determine what the problem is? Yep. Um, so, so yeah, first question to ask yourself, other than am I recovering all the all the other things, right? Am I training? Am I actually training? Am I missing workouts? Is my form good? So, actual programming questions because you've covered all of the low hanging fruit. In other words. Um, so it's time to decide if you need to make a programming change or why you need to make a programming change. So the first thing is, am I getting too much stress or not enough stress? Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, really the, the answer is in looking over your, for, I mean, everything I just said, right. In terms of what your performance looks like, but also you, you look at the last two to three weeks of your training log, like, um, as, as coming out of the novice phase, late novice phase, intermediate, you should still be seeing a continual increase in stress. So overall, your stress should continue, continue to go up. Um, if you've done something like go from three sets of five to three sets of three, you've, you've reduced your stress, right? So you've reduced your stress. If you haven't at the same time bumped the weight up significantly, Right, because the the volume and the intensity are are two things that that you know they're like um, if it, like think of a soundboard, right? And you have the overall you have the overall level of whatever you're listening to, and then you have two knobs over here that you can manipulate to to mess with that overall level. So you can crank the intensity all the way up to make that level overall level go up, but you're going to start clipping. You're going to start cutting things off if you don't reduce the the the, the volume lever, right, and vice versa. So, um, so your overall stress has to has to be uh, has to be continually going up. And if all of a sudden you've done something to your program over the last couple of weeks, you're going to see it on this week's program with a with a with a failed rep. So. Um, a, an example of that would be in something like the press, like you, you're doing the press and you're doing three sets, uh, three sets of five, and then you start failing. So you, you did three sets of five on Monday, 
and then you did a set of five, a set of four, a set of two on Friday. And then you said, well, fuck, I failed. So I'm going to try it again. But, uh, you know, you've only done 11 reps or whatever it is that day. Uh, you were supposed to do 30 reps for the week and you only did 21 reps for the week. Right. Um, at, at, at a point where you're, you're, you're needing every bit of stress for the press. And not only that, you need every bit of practice for the press. So um, what happens on, on next Monday, you try it again, then now you don't get any sets of five. Like you get three, three, two, two, two. You're like, what the hell's going on? And then you go like uh, eat a double cheeseburger and drink a, drink a bunch of milk thinking that's going to help. But you've, you've reduced the stress. You, you, you dumped a bunch of stress. Um, so yeah, look at your training log over the last two weeks. What did I do? What, what did I do that, that caused this? If you haven't done anything, um, like everything's been going fine, or, uh, and then all of a sudden you're having a problem, then you need to figure out, okay, where do, where do I need to add more stress? Like the example there would be one set of five with back offs on Monday, like how we started the, the intermediate program. One set of five with backups on Monday, light day on Wednesday. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, light day Wednesday and then medium day Friday. So if that's the program you're running and it's going smoothly, it's going fine. You're adding five pounds to that first set every Monday. And then all of a sudden um, the, you come in and like, it, it's tough. Like that, that, that's rep number four, rep number five is really, really slow. Then you come in the following Monday and rep one is moving at the same speed as rep four was last Friday you've got a problem, right? You're not, you don't have enough stress. So that's, that's a situation where your recovery is now bam, right in line with your, with the amount of stress and you're not, you're not disrupting homeostasis enough to make another adaptation. So what, what you need to do then is add more stress. So probably the, the, uh, the safest way to do that is okay. So I'm going to go to threes and I'm going to make a 10 pound jump and I'm going to do three sets of three. So you've gone from one set of five heavyweight to three sets of three at a heavy weight. So you've got nine heavy reps now rather than five heavy reps. So ask yourself, is that more stress or less stress? It's more stress, right? So I've, I've got 10 more pounds on the bar and I'm doing nine reps. And when you've been doing a set of five for the last eight months, um, sets of three, even at a 10 pound increase, it's like a vacation. It feels awesome, right? Um, and for, for and then- well, for a little bit, right? Until, until it, it's, you add forty pounds to the bar, and then it sucks again. Yeah, right. That's super. Is helpful. that clear enough? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Does that make Thank sense? you for that. I think that uh, I think I hear a lot of confusion and questions about exactly this topic, and I think that sums it up nicely. So we've got we've got the squad out of the way, we've got the principles out of the way. I want to spend the rest of this time just going through the rest of the lifts quickly, and then if we have time at the end, we can do some more discussion. Um, Let's talk about the deadlift because that's kind of an easy one. So, so Nick, why don't you walk us through the standard progression from day one on the deadlift up until kind of early, mid, intermediate? Yeah, sure. And and this is this is part of the problem of of categorizing yourself as a novice, intermediate, or advanced lifter, right? So it's it's helpful in terms of uh, thinking about where you're where you are in terms of your overall like lifelong training experience. Um, but at any given moment, if you're making decisions based on where you think you are for, um, it, it's, it's just not useful because you're, you, you could be doing novice programming on your squat and be doing intermediate style programming for your deadlift. Mm -hmm. And that's totally common, but nobody gets, nobody gets all weird in the head about it. Um, that's the way so, it should be. You should, you're not, you're not, and that we should have mentioned that at the outset. You're not just a, an intermediate one day. You progress that's each exactly lift right. individually. That's exactly right. right. Yeah. So I will, um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll talk about uh, myself or trainees in terms of these categories of training advancement, just so you have a reference of how long this person's been training and how strong they are. Um, and, and also what kind of programming generally they're doing, but um, it ultimately, it, do, it doesn't matter first of all. So, so don't, don't assign any kind of importance to, to, so don't, don't make it like an achievement that you're unlocking because you don't want the next achievement. Like you want to stay where you're at as long as possible. So it's just a way, it's just kind of a, um, a, a very macro view of where you are in terms of your, your programming and your training history. But beyond that, like on this detailed level, I try to avoid I try to avoid those those categorizations because it gets it, it it it's it's not useful because people latch on to the category and not the information that I'm trying to present. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's a lot easier. Um, 
for sure, for sure. If you can just say a word and then everything falls under that that word, it's it's way easier to to think about things and it's way easier to sell somebody like here is an intermediate program. So you say, okay, me intermediate, I buy intermediate program, I do, and that's super simple, right? Uh, that, but that's not a that's not a that's not an intelligent approach. I think like last time we talked about the smooth brain approach to doing programming, which is like novice LP fail reset, novice LP fail reset, Texas method, and that's like you know that, that's 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 dumb as hell. I feel like you're um, personally attacking me right now, but I but uh, you know let's be um, honest. dude, I, yeah. this is all from personal experience, <laughs> you know, this, and it's not only me. Like you see people doing it all over the place. Like yeah. we everybody everybody did it this way, right? Because that's that's how we interpreted it. And by the way, you know, if if you and I would have picked up practical programming and act, actually read it, we wouldn't have fucked up like that, right? Because after the novice chapter or in the novice chapter, there is a thing called uh, late novice program or advanced novice or something. Like I don't even remember, right? But yeah. there, I mean, it specifically talks about how to progress through the end of the novice phase into the intermediate phase of things. Um, but, you know, we didn't do that because you're thinking about all this cool shit in the Texas method that that doesn't work for us because we're not strong enough to take advantage of it. Right. 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 Yeah. And, so, and quite honestly, I had trouble synthesizing all of Ripito's advice in the blue book, let alone the gray book. And this is kind of the point of this channel and this particular episode. We're just trying to simplify things for you guys. So if you're doing this on your own, you can go do it with uh, fewer issues than what we had. And if you're a coach, you can conceptualize the stuff in a much simpler way. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Let me just state one more time. Like this is the way I do it. This is not like there's, there is no, let me be really clear about this. There is no like approved starting strength progression uh, for how to go from novice to intermediate to advanced because that would be silly. Yep. That'd be stupid. Right. Um, because people are, people are different. People respond differently and you have to approach things from simple, general and basic moving towards complex specific and um individual yeah. right and that's that's the way it works so you have to figure it out for yourself or you hire a coach to help you figure it out and you progress variables along that that progression or that spectrum um or that continuum is, is probably the best way to say it. you you progress your variables along that continuum based on what's happening in your specific process now for almost every well everybody the beginning looks the same Six months, eight months in, it mostly looks the same for almost everybody. A year, two years in, it looks kind of the same, but but mostly like the bulk of the program is going to be individualized to the person you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. All right. So at the at the somebody who's been training for two years, I can hand you guys like um, like if I'm talking to the coaches at the gyms, I can hand them a template that is very general. Like it says, you know, a squat, an upper body lift a pull and upper body lift using this protocol and some, some percentages. Um, and then it's up to them to fill in all of the specifics based on the person they're dealing with. But I, we can also hand every coach at a gym, the novice linear progression and say squat, press, bench, deadlift, power, clean, three sets of five and five sets of three. Um, and everybody's going to do this because that's the way it works. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, let's be, let's be clear because people always ask the question of like how, um, or or they ha ask the question with the intent or with the uh, wanting to understand what is what is the approved like what is the way that that rip is going to stamp and say yes that's the way to do it uh, correctly there there isn't one right, right. there 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 are best practices and again this is the way you do with any complicated uh, process there are best practices um, as long as you you understand what the goal is. And you you keep things as as uh, as basic and simple as you can throughout the throughout the whole thing, mm -hmm. right? Uh, because there's always going to be the tendency to add more uh, and distract you from simple, basic in general, right? So, yeah. um, so I'm saying all that because everything that I'm going to say on on the press and the deadlift is just again just the way I do it. Um, you can do other things, and that's fine as long as you're getting stronger. Um, and as long as you're not deviating too much from the from the, the the parent movements, because when you do that, you don't get as strong as quickly, right? Mm -hmm. You you you, you and, and you you risk wasting time and convincing yourself that things that are happening are happening for reasons that they're not, mm -hmm. right? So that's that's the danger. So 
Um, again, trying to keep things as simple as possible for the deadlift. Um, and this is pretty, pretty standard. You know, you're deadlifting every workout initially, and then you, you're going to, you're going to, uh, alternate with some other pulling movement, right? The, we, we like the power clean because to the extent that you can train timing, coordination, and power, um, and by train using, using rips definition of, um, of physiologic, physiologic adaptation, um, if you can train those things, the best way to do it is with the load and the best way to do it measurably is with the power clean, right? Cause you get a long range of motion. You have a, a definite start and end point. You're using all of the muscles in your body. So as uh, you know, most muscle mass, all that stuff. Um, and, uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's objective. It gives you an objective, um, start point and end point. So did you rack the bar or not? Right. Mm -hmm. So you can dream up all kinds of different ways to, to train, timing coordination and power um so so athleticism in other words but you're going to have a hard time quantifying how you're training those right you're going to have a hard time quantifying how you're progressing those so the power clean is nice that it gives you a number that's on the bar did you rack it or did you not rack it right so um so if you're not interested in those things or you can't do that, do that lift because of orthopedic issues, you know, you're, uh, you, you've got a herniated disc in your back or your knees are all torn up or you can't rack the bar, you'll do, you'll do a different lift, right? So you'll do uh, either a lighter deadlift or you can do, you can do something else. So, uh, <clears throat> but you start alternating the lift. So you start al alternating the deadlift with something else. One set of and one set of five, one set of five deadlift alternating with something else. And then eventually you start deadlifting once a week. Um, Actually, Nick, can I stop you there real quick? Um, go ahead. Yeah. So, so everyone does this differently, right? But typically I, um, instead of going straight to alternating the deadlift with another lift, I'll actually just alternate on a Wednesday. So I've got the trainee still deadlifting twice a week and then sure. I'll move yeah. to every other workout. Um, yeah. What's your, what's your take on that? Worth, worth doing that or doesn't matter. Perfectly fine. Yeah. Perfectly fine. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's perfectly fine. Um, if if I've got somebody who's learning the power clean, um, I want them to practice it fairly often. So I'll, uh, you know, I don't I don't think, especially if their squat is still going up every workout, I'm not too worried about about, about it right now. Um, and remember that you you started the deadlift much heavier than you did the squat, so there's a little bit of room there. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that's that's perfectly fine. Just go, just just sub in a different lift on Wednesday. So you're kind of staying with that heavy, heavy, light, heavy situation that we did on the squat. That's cool. And, and uh, it gives you a much shorter workout on, on uh, Wednesdays. Yeah. And, and the reason I like doing that is to, is to give a little bit of psychological reprieve and also because I want to drive the deadlift up as high as possible, especially yep. in front of the squat, because I'm, yep. I'm all about, um, you know, number on the bar performance. That's what we're here for. But I also realize that I'm being paid by that 40 year old guy to make him look awesome. And uh, a huge deadlift makes you look great. So I want your deadlift no as big as possible. No question. People people uh, don't don't appreciate the amount of uh, of aesthetic change that you get from from deadlifting often and deadlifting from pulling heavy and pulling often. Yep. So so absolutely, I'm on board with that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> for sure. So, uh, but this is one of those things. It's like uh, that. That's totally cool. Uh, does it how much does it really matter because i i don't know how how quickly after that you're going to once a week deadlift pretty quickly uh, yeah pretty quickly right so a couple weeks uh exactly exactly maybe three weeks maybe let's say a month even so um long in the long long term kind of like you and i are not going to have a a, a a falling out over this particular issue because it's not a big deal <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, I so, defer to you, um, by the way. You're the guy that gives the programming <laughs> lecture at the seminar, so you're, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, man. Um, the 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 one cool thing about and and I don't know why people people uh, struggle to understand this or don't figure it out, but if if you've got a light squat on Wednesday and you're going to once a week pulling, move the heavy pull to Wednesday. Yeah. And now you've got a fresh lifter pulling a heavy PR deadlift every Wednesday. Um, so you're not dealing with all of the fatigue from the squat and, uh, and then you can continue to drive the, the deadlift up. So I really, really, really want 
the the lifter to continue doing heavy sets of five on the deadlift off the floor for as long as possible. Yep. Way too many people switch to rack pulls way too early. You've got to keep pulling off the floor for as long as possible four sets of five. Yep. Um, the 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 problem is that the deadlift allows you to trick yourself into thinking that it's time to move on to something else way 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 before you actually need to. Um, you know you can if you didn't if you didn't pull on on that on the bar for five seconds six seconds um, or what feels like five to six seconds or what feels like 10 seconds you didn't give it you didn't give it a full effort right so like if you're if your if your deadlift isn't and this is where that 50 pound number comes from if your deadlift isn't 50 pounds ahead of your squat you can do a set of five at that weight so you know you're you're squatting 275 you're deadlifting 280 um, you can do 280 for five on the deadlift like right now today you can do it you can actually probably do 330 or more than that it's just you know you're not you you haven't practiced that you're not used to it you're uh, uh it's it's just not there today but you have the strength in other words to be able to pull that bar off the floor five times and and but, a point you've you've made many times in the past is the trainee may not actually have any idea what it means to to work hard against something and so that's exactly right they, they just may not have and this is this is where the coach comes in because I can look at someone that goes to set up for a deadlift. They kind of I can tell they put in about seventy percent effort, tugged on it for a second. Yep. They go, oh, it's not budging. Like no, 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 no. Right. <laughs> take sixty seconds. Yeah. Take a breath, and let me tell you what you need to do in this next in this next attempt. Right. Yeah. 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 Yep. So uh, so yeah, that's the deadlift. I mean, pretty pretty early on, you're you're only deadlifting once a week. Um, and, and the determining factor in when you progress the deadlift, the deadlift isn't a lift that you're going to forget how to do. Um, it's, it's a really simple movement. So, um, it, it doesn't require a bunch of frequency. It's really, it's really heavy as long as you're doing it correctly, meaning that you're completing your sets of five, it's probably giving you enough stress because you're also squatting a bunch, right? You're doing all this, all this squatting as well. So um, if you only need to squat, deadlift one set of five because things are heavy enough and you can continue uh, to do that, then great, just deadlift one heavy set of five and just make sure the weight keeps going up and make sure you don't fail reps. Um, it's gotta be a set of five because that's, you're only pulling stress for the entire week, right? I mean, you're doing lighter pulls for the rest of the week, but in terms of the adaptation that we're looking for, which is the which is a strength adaptation, the bulk of your stress is coming from that single set of five, and you have to make sure you get it done. Yep. <clears throat> so uh, it's really super important. Last question on the deadlift for you is uh, this whole idea of um, going back to ten pound jumps on the deadlift once the guy's let's say early intermediate on the squat is something that was new to me before you introduced me to it. I have yet to test it. Um, can you walk me through that scenario? Because I'm, the thing I'm thinking is, is I've got, okay, let's say the guy is an early intermediate and he's, you know, uh, low three hundreds on a squat, um, for his heavy set of five. And then his deadlift is, you know, you know, mid to high three hundreds. Um, is that a situation where you'd have the guy start doing 10 pound jumps? No, okay. no. Uh, well maybe, maybe it depends. It depends what's happened along the way. So usually when you're in that situation, um, what's happened is that, because remember, you started the deadlift, or you should have started the deadlift way ahead of the squat. So things shouldn't like start to, uh, the numbers shouldn't start to like meet until until you're much further along in the process. So what's probably happened along the line is that they failed um, a couple times. They pro they may have had issues setting their back, so their deadlift was artificially held back. Mm. They may have uh, give, just given up you know, a bunch on it. They may have missed workouts on the, on the deadlift. Cause that always happens. You know, people don't, you got to squat first. So people always squat, but they tend to, if they're going to skip something, they're going to skip the deadlift. Um, that's a way to play should, catch up is what you're saying. Exactly. Right. So you. if they okay. need to catch up that that's when we're going to do it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, if everything's, if everything's been running fine and normally then I no, that's not somebody you would do that with. Okay. In that case, I have one more question for you on the deadlift. So if they're doing, if their program is dialed in and they're doing the one set of five and it's going up and they're, they're getting to the point where rep five is a, is a two, three second rep um, and their recovery is great and you're going to make a change. What's your next change, Nick, on the deadlift? For the deadlift? Yeah. Um, provided that they're doing everything correctly and the deadlift's getting super heavy, I, I prefer to keep people doing a set of five rather than messing with the rep scheme on the, on the deadlift and pulling off the floor. So I'll move them to, to a low rack pull 
and keep doing sets of five. Low so rack you know, pull like mid shin. Mid shin, exactly. So so not all the way up to below the knee, but just mid shin, get it off the floor a little bit, just just to uh, um, just to shorten the amount of time that they're pulling on the bar, and then just keep running with sets of five. That that works the best. The problem when I say that is that people people do that way too early yeah. so you you like you've got you've got dudes pulling 275 off the pins um that's that's totally inappropriate like they right. should be pulling off the floor still right yeah. and, unless he's uh, 80 you know for yeah for sure yeah <laughs> yeah um okay got it so let's move on to the bench press um walk us through your simple summary of the early stages of training on the bench and then what sort of changes you'll make when it's time to move to intermediate programming yeah, so the upper body lifts are um, start at a different point, right? Because you're alternating them, so you're only seeing them three times every two weeks. Where the deadlift and the squat, you're you're you have a lot higher frequency. So, um, you know, you start three sets of five, alternating uh, alternating the lifts. Week one, you bench press, bench. Week two, you press, bench press. So, uh, three sets of five, keep adding weight to the bar. Usually, the the bench keeps progressing far beyond the, where the, the press keeps progressing. So, um, with the bench, uh, and again, this is, this is my pre my preference because most of the people I deal with want to, um, want to press, uh, more weight than they're pressing. So they're, so they're, they're, a lot of people are coming to me because they want, they want me to help them with their press. So, uh, or they, they know that I can help them with their press. So, uh, and, and again, this is my, my preference because I like the press, but I like, enjoy coaching and teaching or coaching and doing the press much more than I do the bench press. So I always just in my head am, am prioritizing the press because it's harder to do and it it's it's more complicated in terms of programming. So um, I typically deal with the the bench the same way that I do with the de the the squat. So um, three sets of five, keep running it. When it starts to become a problem, one set of five, back off sets, uh, still alternating. Yep. I don't uh, I don't mess with it further until the press needs modification, and then the programming on the press determines what the programming for the bench looks like. Got it. In that so, case, can you walk now, us through the programming on the press? Yeah, yeah. One, just one more thing. With sure. that said, if I've got if I've got a, a, a lifter who has a very shitty bench, um, <clears throat> and th th this is pretty common, right? It's like you get you get fairly active guys, um, and and and. Uh, and this is this is true for almost all women. You're fairly active guys who like maybe were runners or cyclists, and they'll have a pretty good uh, deadlift and squat, uh, but just an atrocious bench and press. So uh, if that's the case and their bench is super behind, then I'll I'll treat their bench the same way as I do their press, which just means doing it more often and keeping it really really heavy. So mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the press starts at three sets of five. Uh, alternating every workout. And then the first thing that starts to happen on the press is you start failing, you start missing reps. I'm, I'm not as concerned about failing reps on the press initially as I am with the squat. So the squat, the squat is kind of my overall gauge for how the, the, the lifter is doing. Um, and it's also the, the toughest mentally in terms of getting in the gym and starting it right in terms of actually in sort of, in terms of actually executing and getting the five reps the deadlift is definitely the hardest um but if you can get somebody to come in and do the do the three sets of five squat um and, and that's that's your best gauge for how things are going overall so um that's the one i don't want to mess with in terms of in terms of people failing i don't want them to fail a squat in training ever if possible i want you to fail reps in at your meet but not not in training mm. um and uh uh, for the, so point is that for the press, you start failing. I, I don't see it as much of a big deal. We got to figure out what's going on. So you start failing the press. Um, the first thing that I'm going to do is tell you to get all 15 reps so that we keep the volume the same so that we don't, so that, so that what, what doesn't happen is that you don't get that reduction in stress that we were talking about earlier. Cause as soon as you start missing, if you pack it up for the day, now you're dumping a whole bunch of practice and stress for the upper body. So two things that you you need critically at this point because your upper body's weak, right? So <clears throat> get all 15 reps, doesn't matter how you get it done. And usually that shakes out as like five, four, three, uh, one, one or something like that, or five, four, three, two. So it doesn't matter how many sets it takes, you get all 15. So that's the first change. We'll just run that as long as, uh, as long as it's not taking too long to do. So uh, don't take your belt off, rack the bar, shake it out, 
rest for 30 seconds and then hit it again, see how many you can get type thing. So um, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't get us very far because what happens is that uh, when you start getting down to like uh, a bunch of sets of two and one, it just takes, it just takes too long. So um, when, when that's the case, when you're getting down to like really low reps that you can complete, um then we'll add a second press day so that's 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 pretty much it so uh once the the 15 total reps thing isn't working very well um then just add a second press day and when you add a second press day what it looks like is i want a a day that's all sets of five so three to five sets of five um at a weight that you will hit like you're not allowed to fail reps on that day. You have to hit sets of five and you cannot fail any reps. So I want to see sets of five on day one. And then I want to see a bunch of singles on day two. So that can be anywhere from five to 10 singles, depending on how shitty your press is. And then the bench press gets fit in somewhere in there. So let's just say, for example, um, I have a, a typical, typical member, typical client on Monday, they're going to be doing their three by five bench, or maybe it's like a one by five and some back off sets. Then on Wednesday, they're doing three to five sets of five press. And then on Friday, since remember, we're, we're squatting light on Wednesday and we're deadlifting heavy on Wednesday, then Friday, that leaves us some room. I can have them squat on Friday and then I can have them press like seven singles and then I can have them do a, a heavy set of five of bench. So now you're doing both upper body lifts twice a week and just increasing the frequency from twice twice a week to alter from alternating to twice a week, that usually just kickstart another round of increases on the upper body lifts. It makes a big difference, yeah. And and you mentioned uh, th- there's a couple things we should we should add. When you're running your upper body lifts up, you'll need to move to two and a half pound jumps. We mentioned that in the in the first podcast. So I just want to reiterate that. And then Nick also mentioned that um, on the upper body stuff, when you're doing the the uh, the volume day or the medium day, whatever you want to call it. Um, <clears throat> three to five sets of five, and Nick, just confirm my understanding here. So, so um, the f- the fewer amount of the, the the least amount of work you can do to accomplish the goal is what you're after. So, if you have a choice right. between three sets of five, four sets of five, and five sets of five, three sets of five, and then if that stops working, four sets of five, and then if that right. stops working, five sets of five. Right? Yep. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, on the on the upper body. Another factor is how how strong you already are, right? So if somebody has a fairly big bench press um, and, a, and a fairly big press, uh, they can do three sets of five. If they've got a really um, underdeveloped bench and press, um, it's a nice way of saying like really shitty bench and press, they're going to do five sets of five. So yeah. And, and by the way, those those five sets of five and those singles are happening with a very short rest because they're not stressful. You know, you're squatting in the high twos, maybe low threes, and you're pressing 130 pounds. Uh, that, that 130 pounds um, is not stressful. And if you're doing five sets of five off of a 130 pound single, you're doing them at like 120. So you can knock out five sets of five at 120 pounds in, in uh shit, man, under 20 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Just knock them out. You know, <clears throat> Bree, you got to add Ben's video of him doing his 175 pound press last week uh, under Nick's guidance. Cause Nick's gotten, Nick is, uh, Ben is, my brother is one of these uh, slow responders on the upper body stuff. And Nick has managed <laughs> to get his, his press to 175 pounds. And I want to show that video one, cause I'm proud of him and he looks awesome. Um, and secondly, because it was probably a five second rep and it might've even dipped down a little <laughs> bit above his forehead, but he didn't give up. And the thing, the thing uh, locked out at the top. So that was pretty impressive to watch. Yeah, Ben's bar speed is about equal to like my fifty-eight-year-old women. <laughs> but he doesn't give up, and he's still he doesn't give progress. up, man. Yeah, and doing hey, you know what? It, too. Yeah, it's not a knock on Ben. Steve yeah. Ross is the same way. Steve, Steve, I always tell Steve that like I, I've got a client. Um, you know, you know, Delise. Oh yeah. She, I, I've seen her. I've seen her grind on a press for nine seconds. Jesus. Um, and Steve Ross does the same thing. I just this get worried a, people are going to pass out, you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, shit, shit, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, 
we're we're running a b- up at about the time I'd like to probably wrap things up. Um, I think we you did a really good job of explaining the principles here, um, explaining a sample of how to run through each lift and covering all the key points. Is there anything that you missed that you want to cover before we wrap up here? Uh, just the just the larger point that when when you get to uh, quote unquote intermediate programming. So let's just say let's just say um, when you are uh, post novice so you're beyond novice training uh you your the the stress level has to be continually increasing that's an easy thing to do uh it happens automatically in the novice program right because you're just adding five pounds every time it's easy to screw things up really bad on the uh once you've gone to weekly increases and then bi-weekly increases and so on uh <clears throat> because people tend to dump stress so things things cannot get easier. If they get easier, if you're excited about the programming change that you just made, it's uh, it's it wasn't a good programming change. Like you're about to run into some problems. So um, when you look at the next programming change that you should make, you may be excited about it initially because it may be, mean some more PRs. It may mean doing sets of three rather than sets of five. Uh, it may mean doing singles for the first time, but um, those need to suck pretty bad, pretty pretty quick. And if they don't, um, if they don't, you're doing something wrong. And, and honestly, for, for people who are doing, who start out with the, with starting strength, you're kind of, you're kind of, ex, you're kind of always excited for the PR. So, um, that, that, that may even be the wrong approach or the wrong way to think about it because the PRs are kind of what you're, what you're driving. So you, you, you can kind of psych yourself up for those. Uh, you got to look at the rest of the week too, and make sure that you're not dumping stress on the other days of the week. The, like the number one mistake when people people ask me to look at their programming and tell me what they're doing wrong or why, why they're they're failing is be, is not because they're doing something wrong on the heavy days, intensity days, whatever you want to call it, on the PR days, because they're doing something wrong on the other days. They're they're using a protocol that doesn't work. They're trying to do either too much work or not enough work. Um, <clears throat> so so figure out how to like try to look at your program from a big picture perspective and and just try to imagine what the overall stress is compared to last week and the week before and the week before that. And uh, if you can, if you can kind of zoom out and look at your program at that level, uh, you'll be much more successful. So you should be looking at your stress, just kind of continually going up somewhere and it doesn't, and and you got to move beyond just thinking individually on the lifts. You also have to consider the overall stress of your program um, because it's definitely a factor, right? So you have to, um, it's probably the most important thing as you go uh, through you know, your, your six to six month to one year. Um, and then definitely after you're, you've been training for two years, you have to always be considering the overall stress that you're applying to yourself. Um, so with that said, the stress needs to be a force production stress. As soon as it stops being a force production stress, you're going to stop hitting PRs. And you may think you're doing things like hypertrophy or getting jacked or whatever, but you're not getting stronger. And whatever you're trying to accomplish with your hypertrophy work or whatever other shit you're trying to do, um, that is best accomplished by continuing to get stronger, yep. right? So um, that's that's the time to look at your program, make sure you're still actually strength training, and then you know at the at the intermediate phase, uh, quote unquote, is when people start thinking about other things to do, which is great, right? You, you, other other hobbies, people pick up jujitsu. Um, the, the, the guys who are just in their garage, um, and don't, don't have other hobbies. This is when they start talking about going on a cut or some shit. Um, regardless of what you're doing, doesn't matter if you're like going on a cut or, uh, doing jujitsu or starting to play tennis or whatever it is. Um, <clears throat> you should continue be, to be trying to get stronger. Everything else needs to fit into that. You know, if it's a cut, you need to clean up your diet. If it's jujitsu, you're going to have to back up or, or another sport. You're going to have to figure out where to back off on, on the overall stress so that you can continue working on the, uh, on the force production stress in the gym. Um, so that's kind of a, a complicated uh, topic, but you have to, you know, you're, you're in this because you want to keep, you want to keep getting stronger. You want to maintain your strength or continue gaining strength. And that should always be the goal regardless of, of what else is going on. Um, your performance improvements on in your hobbies and in your life, your aesthetic improvements, um, and, and all, all the other things that come with barbell training that you enjoyed during the novice linear progression, you, you, you need to still be continuing to drive towards those things uh, in advanced, in more advanced programming 
just becomes more complicated. And that's, you know, honestly, that's a, it's a good time to hire a coach to help you manage all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're no longer going to get stronger by accident. I mean, um, you can, exactly. right. you can, you can screw things up and meander your way to a 300 pound squat with shitty programming and take, take, you know, six months or take several years. Most people can do that. But once you get to that point, um, it's, it's really hard to freestyle and just figure things out and hopefully make some progress. You really need to become your own coach and learn this stuff or hire someone that can help yeah, you. Exactly. Yeah. That's a great point, man. Yeah. If you're not going to hire a coach and, and you know, that's, that's kind of self-serving for us to say you need to hire a coach. Um, but it, it's, it's the truth, yeah. but look, we talk about this all the time, like in our self-sufficient lifter camps and, and stuff like that, you, you can, you can do this yourself, but it's going to have to take, it's going to take some effort. Like yes. you get to, you're going to have to, you're going to have to experiment. You're going to have to uh, uh, read some stuff, uh, read practical programming for sure. Uh, read the barbell prescription. Don't convince yourself that you are an old person because you're over 40, but, but read the, the barbell prescription. Um and, uh, and, and get to work applying this to yourself, just make small changes so that you don't screw everything up. Yep. Um, but, but if, if that's you, if you want to, if you like to tinker, if you like to learn about the, the, uh, the process yourself, then uh, apply it to yourself carefully and apply it to other people. Uh, you can definitely, you can definitely gain a lot from doing it that way. Um, if you're not going to spend the time, like learning how to, pr how to program yourself and program other people, then, then hire a coach and outsource it, yep. right? Yep. Or do it wrong, hurt yourself, and then start doing hypertrophy. <laughs> uh, yeah. Nick, this I, was super helpful. Thank you for your time, man. Good, um, good. Anything you want to add before you before you, uh, we go? Social media handle, stuff like that? Uh, social media handle, uh, Nick D underscore SSC. Cool. Um, we've got... Uh, no, other than that, I mean, I think everybody knows where to where to find me. Great, yeah. And if you guys listen to this, have have questions and comments, definitely throw them in the YouTube uh, comments because those are always fun. But <laughs> I don't think YouTube comments are the best place to discuss intermediate programming. So, um, if you have a legitimate <laughs> question about your situation, the forum has answered all questions that have ever been asked. And if you search around and you can't find the answer to your question, then post, and it can be addressed in detail there, provided you you put some time into a thoughtful post. That's the YouTube comments is just not appropriate for this kind of conversation. Cool. Thank you, Nick. Till next time. All right. Thank All right. you. See you guys.